All right, so there are a couple of basic principles that are underlying neurotransmission. And again, this is going to hark back to some uh, of your high school biology. So one is that you have a concentration gradient. So a concentration gradient is, is a relatively straightforward idea, but it's really, really important. So a concentration gradient is that something from a greater concentration will spread out until it is equally distributed. So if you drop uh, ink or food coloring or all sorts of things in water, it will diffuse from that initial point of contact where it has this largest concentration until it is equally distributed throughout the water. And so if you then measure distribution as a function of time, it will might take a little bit of time, but it, it will start highly concentrated in one area and then it will slowly spread out until after sufficient time has passed, then this ink or whatever food coloring that you were happen to put in the water would be completely distributed similarly throughout the water. Okay, the next principle is a voltage gradient. Okay, so a voltage gradient underlying follows relatively the same principles but it's looking at how instead of something like ink and it's just basic concentration it's looking at how things as a fun that have a voltage will become distributed across water so if a salty solution is poured into water and the salty solution will have potassium um, sodium uh, maybe a little bit of chloride, the positive and negative ions will flow down their electrostatic gradients until positive and negative ch charges are equal everywhere. Okay, So again here, you can see that you pour it in and it will have, um, it'll be more concentrated and over time this will spread out and what you notice here is that these are um, clumped here together so that you have a little bit of the negative, you have a little bit of the positive, it's just however you pour them into the water. But over time, these are going to naturally distribute themselves so that you have a pattern of positive and negative and positive and negative. So the positive and negative charges will be equally distributed everywhere. And they'll be balanced with respect to each other. So this is what's known as a voltage gradient. And then the final element is that you have a selectively permeable membrane. And we talked about this a little bit in the last chapter, and we're also going to be continuing to talk about it in this one. So here, if you have salt placed in one side of a beaker of water that is divided by a barrier, okay, it will dissolve, and again, it will become equally distributed through this voltage gradient. It will become equally distributed with respect to positive and negative. So they will all be equally distributed on this side of the container. They won't be able to pass through to this other side. So they cannot cross the barrier. So what? So the selective permeability means that if you were to have a membrane that was selectively permeable, and I'll present this more on the next slide, then certain things will be able to pass through. So here's an example of this, okay? So if this barrier has a hole through which these chloride ions can pass through, but the sodium ions cannot, then the chloride will diffuse from the side of high concentration over here through the hole in the barrier, and they will spread out as much as they can. Okay, so they will, because it's high concentration here, so through this concentration gradient, these chloride ions will want to pass to this side. There's nothing over here, they need to equally distribute themselves, so they will pass to this side. Okay. What will then happen is that the chloride will not be equally distributed on the two sides because of the voltage gradient. Okay, So you'll have a concentration gradient that will want to pull them over here, but then there's a voltage element that as these chloride negative ions, these negative anions move over here, Okay, these negative ions move over here, then this side will become positively charged. Okay, And if this side becomes positively charged, it will attract the chlorine items back over here, just like positive and negative charges attract each other. So over time, this will reach equilibrium. And this is basically, equilibrium is when 
um, everything is balanced, okay? One half of the container will be positively charged and the other half will be negatively charged. And there will be a voltage difference between the two, okay? And if you notice, they'll cluster here accordingly. So in this, when you have a selectively permeable membrane, then what happens is that you can play aspects of this concentration gradient and this voltage gradient against each other. Concentration gradient wants things to flow from high concentration to low concentration, whereas the voltage gradient wants things to be balanced with respect to voltage. So if you have a selectively permeable membrane where only certain things go through, then you can naturally create a difference in charge between one side of the membrane and the other. And this is really important because this natural charge will occur without there having to be any active transport that would take energy from the cell, for example. So the selectively permeable membrane that we have in ourselves offers, in our cells, excuse me, offers this type of option where you're going to have the concentration gradient and the voltage gradient playing against each other to create a difference in charge between one side of the membrane and the other side of the membrane, or in the purposes of our cell, a difference in charge between the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell. And importantly, this voltage difference will be greatest the closer it is to the membrane. Okay, so this difference in charge between the inside and the outside uh, and when the cell is based at rest, the sort of equilibrium point is known as the resting potential of a cell. Okay, so this resting potential, the maintenance of this resting potential involves four charged particles that they take place in producing this. Okay, so you have these um, anions here, then you have the potassium ions, and these um, and these um, anions here, these are these negatively charged proteins. Okay, you have the potassium positively charged ions, they have high concentration inside the axon relative to the outside, okay? So inside the cell, you have these negatively charged proteins and these positively charged potassium. Whereas chloride ions and sodium ions are more concentrated outside the axon or outside the cell. So you have more of these outside the cell than inside the cell, okay? So then you would have a circumstance here where concentration gradients would want to make the potassium travel to outside of the cell. And technically you would want these um, negatively charged proteins to be able to travel outside the cell too, but they're too large. Potassium is much smaller. So concentration gradients would want potassium to flow from where it's highest concentration inside the cell to technically where it's lowest concentration outside the cell. And then you have the same type of relationship here where you have sodium and chloride ions that are, have their highest gradient concentration gradient outside the cell and their lowest inside the cell. So they would be wanting to come from the outside to the inside. So if you were to try to record this and you would have one electrode that would record the outer surface of an axon and one that records the inner surface of the, of the axon, then you would see a difference. So by convention, it's important that the extracellular side of the membrane is given a charge of zero. And this is, by convention, this basically means that at some point they decided, okay, well, there's this difference. Which side do we basically set to baseline? So by convention, the outside of the cell is given a charge of zero. So that's the baseline, okay? Therefore, the inside of the cell, the intracellular side of the membrane is negative 70 millivolt relative to the extracellular side. This measurement is the membrane's resting potential. So what this means is, as I said, you have this play of the concentration gradients and the um, voltage gradients, okay? So based on this play of the concentration gradients and the voltage gradients through the selectively permeable membrane, then you have a greater negative charge on the inside of the cell than on the outside of the cell. And this difference is negative 70 millivolts. So this negative 70 millivolts is known as the resting potential. So again, we need the selectively permeable membrane to maintain this resting potential.
large negatively charged proteins remain inside of the cell and the sodium remains outside of the cell. Then you have your concentration gradient, okay, and your voltage gradient. So ungated potassium channels, they allow free flow to reach equilibrium. And so the potassiums are small. And so there are certain channels that they can readily flow, there are certain channels that they can readily cross the membrane. But then you have concentration gradient. They basically, they want to flow from greater concentration inside of the cell to outside the cell. But as you have these positively charged ions that basically flow from inside the cell where they're most, um, have the most of them to outside of the cell, that can actually make the cell more, um, more negative which then would make them want to come back in because they are through this voltage gradient, then they can, if the cell becomes more negative, then the positive, um, the cell attracts these positive charges. So they can reach equilibrium across time. All right, here's a video that we're going to watch that uh, will tell you more about this process. Unstimulated, neurons maintain a constant electrical difference or potential across their cell membranes. This potential, called resting potential, is always negative inside the cell and ranges from negative 40 to negative 90 millivolts. If a neuron is stimulated, the negative potential inside the neuron can be made either more or less negative depending on the stimulus. If potential is made sufficiently less negative, it reaches a level called threshold and an action potential is triggered. During the action potential, the neuron suddenly becomes 20 to 50 millivolts positive inside. Action potentials last a few milliseconds before the cell restores its negative resting potential. The cell membrane of a neuron encloses cytoplasm with various ions dissolved in it. The neuron itself is immersed in a salt solution, the extracellular fluid. The ions of the cytoplasm consist mainly of positively charged potassium ions and large negatively charged organic molecules, such as proteins. Outside the cell, the extracellular fluid contains mostly positively charged sodium ions and negatively charged chloride ions. Since charged particles cannot pass through the lipids that make up cell membranes, they must travel through channel proteins that extend through the membrane. In an unstimulated neuron, only potassium ions can cross the membrane, traveling through specific proteins called potassium channels. Although sodium channels are also present, in unstimulated neurons, they remain closed. Since only potassium ions can cross the membrane and potassium ions are more concentrated inside the cell, they diffuse out of the cell, leaving the large negatively charged organic ions behind. As more and more positively charged potassium ions leave, the inside of the cell becomes increasingly negative. But since opposite charges attract, as potassium ions diffuse out, an electrical force develops that tends to pull them back inside. At some point, the diffusion of potassium ions out of the neuron due to concentration differences is balanced by the electrical attraction tending to pull them back inside. This is the point at which neurons reach resting potential. Reaching resting potential in this way does not require significant changes in the potassium concentration inside or outside the cell. Only about one ten thousandth of the potassium ions initially inside a neuron must leave to create a resting potential of negative 60 millivolts. But it is action potentials, not resting potentials, that carry information through a nervous system. Okay, so the fourth uh, element that is needed to uh, maintain resting potential is what's called a sodium-potassium pump, okay? And so this comes into play after an axon fires. So here are the channels that the ions can flow through, through this selectively permeable membrane, okay? So here is the potassium channel in which you have the free flow of potassium 
inside and outside the cell. Okay, here is a sodium channel. So they are ordinarily closed to prevent the entry of sodium into the cell. Um, there are specific times that they open um, and which we'll be talking about in a little bit. And usually when the cells become aphthic, what happens is the sodium um, channels open and then a flood of the sodium ions come in because they are more concentrated outside the cell than inside the cell. And this raises the um, positivity of the cell uh, and if it raises sufficiently, then an axon, um, you'll have an axon potential and the axon will fire. And then here is a sodium potassium pump. Okay, so what this does is this actively will return the cell to its resting potential equilibrium. So once these um, onions, um, once the ions attach to the sodium potassium pump, then it changes shape and it will transfer them. So this will have um, three sodium ions that will come into the cell for um, two potassium ions that will go out of the cell. Okay, so these also are part of uh, are part of the balance between resting potential and the firing of a neuron. And what will happen is that to return the cell to normal, this is the inside of the cell, and uh, so after a cell has fired, you'll have more of the sodium that are inside the cell, but they need to be returned outside of the outside of the cell to re to main to return to return the cell to resting potential, because once they've once these gates have been opened, they'll flood in, and then now they need to basically be returned back out. So what will happen is that it will this pump will take out three. Um, sodium for two potassium. So we'll say like, okay, here, this is inside of the cell. We'll take three of these, they'll come out, and two potassium will come in. 